Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, be moderating this uh, discussion today uh, about uh, Kubernetes as a foundation for enterprise MLOps. Uh, I am joined by uh, two very awesome guests, and I will let them uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chris Lamb, do you want to say uh, introduce yourself for the the crew? Yeah, I'm Chris. Uh, I run the GPU Computing Software Platforms uh, team at NVIDIA, and uh, uh, I joined NVIDIA almost 15 years ago to work on a little thing called CUDA. Um, and CUDA as a computing platform, that little thing. Yeah, uh, back when it was just a handful of people and you know, folks was like, what, what's that? What's that? Um, and so as a computing platform, um, obviously that grew into something that touches all different, different modalities of deployment from the edge to, to core data centers to of course, client computing and uh, data center is a really important place for a computing platform because it's the, the place where, you know, outside of the end of Moore's law, we're going to be able to scale with parallelism and distributed computing to the applications of the future. Um, and so naturally that brought us into systems and data center scale computing and Kubernetes is right at the heart of that. Awesome. Well, Chris, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, Craig. Hi, I'm Craig McClucky. Um, I'm a vice president of research and development at VMware where I'm responsible for our Tanzu portfolio. So really looking across all of our investments in the Kubernetes and cloud native ecosystem. Um, um, you know, obviously Kubernetes is a big part of that, uh, but we also look across things like um, uh, application centric patterns like Spring, um, our Cloud Foundry investments, and uh, a lot of other open source related projects. Um, I joined VMware as part of the Heptio acquisition, whereas the founder and CEO of this little startup that really helped enterprise organizations bridge the gap between um, open source technologies like Kubernetes and the mainstream needs of, of enterprise groups. And then before that, I worked at Google for a while where my friend Joe and I um, were the uh, sort of early team members on Google Compute Engine and built Google Compute Engine and launched it. And then started the Kubernetes project as a way to bring, you know, container orchestration to organizations at scale. Um, and I started the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as a spiritual home for Kubernetes and a lot of the open source uh, innovation that's happening around the technology. Very cool. Um, and I'll introduce myself. My name is Chris Yang. Uh, I am one of the co-founders and the CTO of Domino Data Lab. Uh, Domino is one of the leading enterprise MLOps platforms. And so we help uh, Fortune 500 companies uh, become more model driven uh, by providing an integrated platform where all model development can happen. And the link here, of course, is uh, we made a, a fateful decision a few years ago to go fully Kubernetes native with our application. And that has been a very successful journey for us. But uh, I may be on the a slightly different side of this table as a, as a consumer, uh, perhaps, of Kubernetes, uh, but also having a lot of firsthand knowledge of seeing how many different enterprises across a lot of different industries are are using technologies like Domino uh, or Kubernetes directly to uh, to bring them along their uh, enterprise and a lot journey. So I'm very excited to uh, uh, be here and uh, moderate this discussion. Let's jump in. Uh, Craig, I think I'll give you uh, uh, first uh, uh, first chance to respond here as, uh, as one of the co-founders of, of Kubernetes. Um, I love maybe a little bit of the origin story, like where did it come from, and and maybe you're if you could speculate a little bit about like why it's really taken uh, IT infrastructure management by storm. I, I love hearing about that. Yeah, I'm no, happy to you know, provide a little bit of perspective. Yeah. Um, so you know, obviously um, there were already kind of three founders of the Kubernetes project. There was myself, Joe, and um, Brendan were the, the, the sort of first team members to kind of play with this and. Um, in many ways, it was, uh, from my perspective, uh, something of a bit of a necessity. Um, we built out Google Compute Engine, which had some really nice operating properties, um, you know, high quality infrastructure, great networking. Um, you know, it was a, a very high quality virtual machine as a service um, offering. Um, but we were really struggling with adoption. Like when you're building a business, and I've always been the kind of business person to complement the technologists. Um, there's a lot of work to do in terms of establishing your sales organization, other pieces. And, you know, I, you know, definitely felt this, this huge opportunity to be a little disruptive in the market. And, you know, all of this happened around the time that uh, Docker was sort of rising in an ascendancy 
Um, and Docker solved this amazing, well, it solved the problem in an amazing way, which is just solved the deterministic packaging and delivery of software uh, in a way that made it incredibly accessible to developers. And so, you know, based on where we were operating within Google, we had obviously a lot of experience with container-based technologies because Borg was running Linux-based containers at, at uh, you know, hyperscale. And we saw this incredible opportunity to disrupt the ecosystem, to introduce a technology that carried forwards a lot of what we'd learned from building and operating container-based systems at scale. Um, we saw ourselves as being uniquely positioned to help drive the enterprise consumption of Docker as a technology. You know, Docker was certainly solving the developer problems, it didn't necessarily solve the operations problems. And so when we looked at the opportunities, it, it just, you know, timing seemed perfect. Um, we saw open source as just an amazing way to engage a, a, a richer group of individuals that could, you know, participate in the journey with us. Um, we didn't need to own the technology, we just needed it to exist and be able to um, operate it well. Um, you know, we had this sort of thesis around uh, GKE or what, what we launched as GCE, the Google Container Engine, as the, the starting point. Um, and, you know, from there, it's all been kind of a bit of a whirlwind. It's, uh, it's hard to believe it's been over seven years since we uh, you know, had those first conversations and got the whole thing going. Um, you mentioned that Docker clearly solved uh, a set of concerns for the, the developers. I'm, I'm curious, was there a, was there a killer feature that um, maybe the, the IT folks saw in Kubernetes that, that made it so appealing to them? You know, the, the adoption of something like Kubernetes was really um, a, a, an evolutionary story. Um, I remember the very early days when we, we put together the, the system, it, it seemed to speak to people, right? Like there were a set of patterns that were introduced that, that represented, you know, it wasn't just Joe, myself and Brendan. It was also a lot of the board team started participating and they had been doing a lot of deep thinking around what this should look like. And it really crystallized a lot of experience in terms of how to build and operate at scale. And so some of the early folks that sort of interacted with the system, you know, it was almost a love letter to distributed systems engineers. They were like, oh, hey, wow. You, you mentioned maybe some of those best practices. Just what was like a concrete lesson that you guys try to vivify through the case design? Yeah, I mean, a, a great example of it was, you know, kind of using um, labels and, um, you know, uh, applying, you know, labels to a system and then um, relying on reconciliation systems. So you could basically attribute something with labels and then rely on independent reconcilers that would, you know, based on the observed set of things that have those set of labels, um, you know, you know, work to kind of you know create uh, create internal consistency. So it was as much a it was much about the control systems that we were bringing to bear. Um, the APIs themselves were incredibly durable. I, I think I, I think it was like I remember watching Joe write down and jotting down the API surface area. It was incredibly durable. Just some of the core concepts, pods, because we knew that containers didn't exist in isolation. You tended to want to be able to group them together and, and have a number of different containers running in the same process space. Um, uh, labels, label selectors, um, you know, the, the whole system just seemed to, it had good taste. Like it, it felt, it, it felt, you know, it felt right. And I think a lot of folks that were struggling with building and operating distributed systems at scale looked at it and they were like, it really resonated with them. It made sense. And that was really a, a pretty small cohort. That was, you know, the sort of crazy West Coast tech cohort, you know, a small number of folks at uh, some of the um, larger enterprise organizations that have been playing with the space for a while and it looked at things like Mesos and um, and it just, it, it spoke to them in a way that I think, um, you know, created a, a sense of opportunity and a sense of, of um, possibility um, that then materialized into a, like a, a highly operational system. I think that's actually in a, a bit of foreshadowing, I would say that that's actually a really great point to make, which is the design of Kubernetes, which has these, in some ways, kind of subtle separation of concerns that speak to the operational aspects of it, um, actually end up mattering a lot, uh, you know, mattering when you get to scale and trying to operate at scale and operate in a diversity of environments. And, you know, that is something that actually we had a sensibility coming from where we had developed CUDA as a, as a parallel programming model. model. Similar sort of thinking that we had in terms of, you know, where parallel programming is this incredibly complex design space. And when you're thinking about an application developer trying to build software that's going to outlive many generations of infrastructure, in that case, you know, GPU hardware, you need to have that kind of separation of concerns that lets the application developer uh, 
target only those aspects that are core to the intent of the application and be able to leave other aspects to the operational instantiation of it. And I think, you know, as we got to, to learn Kubernetes in the early days, um, starting to build up distributed systems, looking at accelerated computing, we saw a lot of those same design themes, which gave us great confidence in it as a, as a core technology to depend on. Chris, maybe to transition to you, um, people have been consuming GPUs for a little while. Um, I'd be curious your take uh, on uh, your guys' philosophy when it came to infrastructure orchestration. I'm, I'm sure there was a time before Kubernetes where you guys were thinking about, you know, strategically uh, the best way to, to facilitate usage. Absolutely. I mean, we, we had a, a, yeah, we had large scale deployments with Mesos and Mesos uh, based deployments with containers uh, and, and we're working on that space. And even before, you know, containerization and support for GPUs in Docker showed up, um, there was a, a, a lot of work going on on adopting GPUs in uh, classic HPC environments. You know, the large supercomputing centers were, were uh, adopting it. Uh, and so, you know, we've had, we've had large scale deployments of GPUs for, you know, well over 10 years at this point. Um, and a lot of the early AI work was really, and, and, and still to this day, I'd say, still relies on a lot of that sensibility that comes out of the classic, you know, large scale HPC space. Uh, and so, you know, uh, from everything from the GPUs to the scheduling to the networking, um, you know, that kind of application level, you know, to the metal optimization. Uh, that you can do with a lot of these HPC systems where everything is really exposed to you down to the NUMA affinity, down to the topology of the network. Stuff that Kubernetes, uh, you know, largely abstract or, or has abstracted in the past. I think this will be an interesting topic to talk about more later, but, um, you know, uh, that in, informed where we wanted to get to in terms of performance and efficiency on a large scale system. Um, and so, you know, the journey, I would say the large scale of the journey that, that we've been on in my team, for example, is charting how to bring that kind of high performance at scale into uh, an operable abstraction that has great separation of concerns architecture like Kubernetes. I'm curious, um, maybe particularly compared to maybe an HPC background in your team's experience, what has Kubernetes made easier and what has it actually made harder? I'm sure there were some, some trade-offs involved actually. That's a great question. You know, I think the things that it's made easier is all of those things Craig mentioned, which is when it comes to thinking about um, operability, when it things that comes, you come to thinking about how you're gonna design a cluster or a set of clusters that are gonna work together, uh, when it comes to, you know, putting guardrails on how bits of the infrastructure are going to be abstracted from networking to compute to storage and how you're going to end up composing those things together and, and be um, declarative in intent rather than declarative in implementation. You know, that that design framework for solving the problems that we're solving has made everything from the operations to the architectural evolution that we've been investing in much, much more straightforward. There's a, there's a framework and a set of guidelines there. There's also an incredible community. And, and I can't, I think that is, you know, probably one of the most important things about Kubernetes is that when you think about all of the things that come, not on day zero, but on day two, that come down the line when you want to deploy, when you want to have multiple teams using it, you want to get into more complex deployment scenarios, there's a rich ecosystem of community projects and talent and expertise that's out there that you can draw on, uh, you know, as an R&D organization or on just an organization that's trying to deploy this stuff to get a solution to everything from your, you know, security or your auditability problem or some storage integration, you know, network visibility. There's all of these rich tools available to solve all these problems. And I think that that has just, you know, uh, I think that's that's been enabled by the great architecture, but in terms of something that really is a reason for an organization to go and say, yeah, I'm comfortable investing in this approach with Kubernetes today, uh, I think that seals the deal. Um, we here at Domino um, decided maybe three or four years ago to go all in on Kubernetes to support 
the data science and the machine learning workloads that our customers needed. It also had the added benefit of um, we support a lot of customers in different environments. And so Kubernetes, both as a particular infrastructure orchestrator, which is super valuable and uh, to Craig's point, uh, has a great sense of taste, but also as an evolving standard in the enterprise to be able to go to uh, uh, you know any given company and say, hey, we need a Kubernetes cluster and they know what that means, or at least uh, now they increasingly they do, maybe four years ago, it was a little bit more on the fence. Um, and Chris, just to react to what you were saying about the open source um, community, that's been a huge boon for us in terms of all of the data science specific operators and like open source support for all these other tools. That's really been a, a core part of our um, strategy as well to be able to deliver all of this, all these capabilities for our customers. I'm, I'm curious, Craig, for your reaction, I'm speculating a little bit, but I'm sort of betting that however many years ago, you all weren't really thinking about, you know, high performance compute or being able to do using Kubernetes to orchestrate uh, big deep learning uh, training jobs. I'm, I'm curious what would you have made different design choices or is there anything that's sort of still uh, is a little bit uh, impedance mismatched with maybe the sort of core assumptions or design principles of Kubernetes for these use cases? I think it's it's an interesting question because um, you know, it's funny. There were there were sort of decisions that we made along the way that I think were just incredibly impactful. I remember Tim Hawkins, for instance, driving the decision to do um, IP per pod. That wasn't obvious, but he had you know seen the the complexities of trying to do port mapping at scale, and you know, so there was a lot of that sort of institutional knowledge that came from the Borg ecosystem that I think you know, absolutely paid dividends into the future. And, and, you know, we can really be appreciative of some of those decisions. Um, there are other decisions. I, I mean, I remember being very specific with the team around thou shalt not work on uh, features around, you know, more than 100 nodes. I remember getting into these kind of like, um, you know, community um, sort of arguments with Mesos. And they're like, oh, it's a toy. It doesn't scale. And I was like, nope. Like, because yeah, you could see the, the sort of anger rising in these, uh, Google engineers are like, well, you know, we, we know how to do this to 10,000 nodes. It's like, no, 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 no. Just like stay focused on 100 nodes. The consumption model is going to be much more smaller and more, more granular. We don't want people rolling out a 10,000 node cluster at this point of our, our evolution because um, it's just not, uh, it's not a, a sort of natural uh, consumption model. And so I think in the early days, a lot of the sort of whether it was by, you know, sort of intelligent design or by, you know, specific focus, like, I was really focused, you know, and trying to get the team to focus on building it for Google Kubernetes engine. Um, I saw the, the consumption model as like a large number of smaller clusters. Um, the operating costs associated with, you know, turning up a managed service expression of Kubernetes was um, was relatively low. And, uh, you know, we, we, we could take an SRE team and, you know, scale it indefinitely. So I think one of the things we did see start to emerge in the community was this ethos of like a large number of smaller clusters. Um, clusters as um, as as cattle, not pet uh, pets. The you know certainly like the amount of investment that we made early on in the scheduling logic and uh, you know wasn't really optimized around some of these HPC style um, use cases. Now it has been interesting to see as the technologies matured and as organizations have started to invest in some of these types of, of use cases. You know obviously the, the, the you know, more and more capabilities are being put into the platform, but um, we definitely do see, you know, some, I think, tension in terms of like, what is the logical breaking point of, of, of scale? If you look at the consumption model that the cloud providers are tending to offer up, which is, you know, a large number of smaller clusters, um, you know, it, it, it definitely does, you know, sort of emerge to be something that ends with with that sort of that, that, that sort of HPC style workload. Um, but, you know, I think because we were able to carry forwards a lot of the experience of folks like um, Brian Grant and Tim Hawkins and the, the, the Borg and Omega teams. Um, you know, the bones were sufficiently robust that it, it, it could ultimately you know, lead us into a direction where, where we can scale you know, reasonably well with the technology. Were there other impedance mismatches besides scale? Um... I think, you know, one of the things... Um, you know, certainly early on, and, and you know, uh, Chris talked a little bit about, you know, being able to do a lot of the hardware level optimization and, you know, being able to, you know, tweak and tune and, and sort of increase the 
the sophistication of the scheduler. Like, I would say, you know, as a starting point, the you know the scheduling apparatus was relatively naive. You know, it's, it certainly didn't have a lot of the attributes of of something like a, of like a a, a Borg. Um, you know, and we built it around virtualized infrastructure. So, you know, we built the technology so that it would run in virtual machines. So we weren't overly concerned with the idea of being able to drive uh, resource isolation, um, you know, recognizing that the, you know, the Linux kernel itself can become a contention point for, um, you know, resource. You have a single TCP IP stack. And so as you start to slaughter on a lot of different workloads, in a system like Borg, you could look for crosstalk. You could look for um, noisy neighbor patterns. You could make more informed scheduling decisions because you had a much more sophisticated you know, scheduling apparatus. And so Kubernetes was relatively nascent. And I think this this is kind of it did create this almost you know peculiar false dichotomy between virtualization and uh, and containers. Um, in, you know, in, in many cases, the answer is both. Like, hey, you can actually run a container in a in a hardware accelerated virtualized construct just just fine we're seeing the cloud providers start to kind of lean into that um that that capability um but i definitely think that um you know certainly early on in the in the journey you know folks that were looking to do like you know direct on the metal deployments of kubernetes it just wasn't enough intelligence in the system to get the most out of their infrastructure it just wasn't able to you know um drive the uh, the resource level optimization at the infrastructure level that, that folks were expecting but that's obviously you know you know, through the work of folks like Chris and others, you know, changing pretty quickly. Yeah, I remember early on when when we were, you know, Kubernetes doesn't have the the concept of your fixed size bare metal data center is out of resources and can't scale up. And of course, you know, if you've got a fixed size deployment, that matters. And so, you know, I, I think we have worked through all of that, everything from you know how to deploy on bare metal and making that straightforward to actually get something up when you don't have a virtualization layer below you. To things like you know some of the early work that Nvidia did with uh, the you know the Nvidia you know uh, container toolkit and the container libraries that would expose the hardware the acceleration hardware through to the containers in a in a consistent way. Uh, recently worked to do that with the accelerated networking hardware from the the Mellanox networking stack, um, and I think we made huge strides in that. Um, a lot of stuff has gone out in now into uh, you know. Supporting NUMA and topology where decisions in the in the scheduler and in the the container placement um, algorithms in the kubelet, um, it's not done yet. There's actually you know uh, upstream initiatives right now on a, on a standardized container device interface that um, CDI that will take a lot of the work that was pioneered with with early device exposure and, and put it in a really concrete way that allows pods to specify the kind of resources that they need declaratively in a consistent way. Um, similarly, there's uh, you know an upstream work on a dynamic resource allocator that's going to add hooks for more sophisticated scheduling into the scheduler. You know, I think you know we're still in the midst of that journey, but it's uh, it's certainly not blocking right now. We've got a really great point in time solution today, and it's just going to get better. I thought I might um, change topics a little bit uh, and focus a little bit about how we're seeing folks actually implement Kubernetes, particularly for these machine learning, learning workloads. Chris, I thought it um, might be great to start with you. What patterns or anti-patterns are you seeing uh, in your team, uh, in your team's work with, with different customers? Any, any tips or tricks you might be able to, to share with the audience here? Well, you know, I think the... Um... You know, something that Craig touched on with this, this idea of clusters are cattle, not pets, um, is very different than the way trusters are treated historically in high-performance computing environments. But that's something that, for example, we adopted in our deployments within NVIDIA. You know, we don't have one big Kubernetes cluster tied to one data center that everything is, is, is pumped into. That creates a, you know, not only do you have to then start working on scaling problems with scaling the Kubernetes cluster potentially and managing it that way, but you also can get tied into data locality and things that really tie you, especially if you were deploying on bare metal, to a physical location. And you, and you really don't want that. One of the beautiful things about Kubernetes is that because it's such ubiquity you know, across various ways to get it on bare metal, ways to get it in the cloud, is you really want to take advantage of the fact that your workloads are more transportable. And so we've really taken to that in, in our deployment in NVIDIA across 
tens of thousands of GPUs and multiple data centers is with a number of Kubernetes clusters, not you know big you know, monolithic ones across the data. So I think a pattern there is, you know, and that's one that's where you get to when you start scaling really is, you know, do prepare for that multi-cluster, multi-data center, the transportability of your workload. And that really gives you access to a lot of these patterns that allow you to take advantage of hybrid cloud. So I think that, you know, not designing yourself into a corner when you start building on top of Kubernetes uh, is a, a real clear pattern. Think about that ahead of time where you have choices to make. Um, and, you know, I think, and the corner is, right. I, that's right, actually Definitely. grow roots. If you grow too many roots into your physical location, you know, uh, sometimes it may be expedient sort of punch through the abstractions to get something done. Don't do that. Use the abstractions. They'll help you in the long term to give you options down the line. Craig, maybe a similar question to, to you. What what patterns and anti patterns are you seeing in terms of Kubernetes implementations? Yeah, I would say that um, you know one of the one of the key kind of um, things that I've been a, a big advocate for is really investing in operationalization right from the get go. Um, you know, I remember in some of the earlier you know I, I've I've obviously worked with a lot of of enterprise organizations through the evolution of of the technology and seen a lot of self service consumption, a lot of vendor based consumption, a lot of um, uh, SaaS based consumption of of the offering, and I think. You know, making the investments up front to just deal with the the one on one level operationalization of the technology. Um, you know, I, I, a pretty typical pattern that we would see in industry, and, and you know, in some ways to this day still exists, is you know, organization will say, okay, I'm going to you know, I'm going to adopt Kubernetes. So they'll stand up one large Kubernetes cluster, and they're like, okay, well, now I'm going to um, use the namespace construct to partition that across a number of different organizations, and you know, use that to to manage you know resource isolation and what they quickly discover is one is you've got very high levels of concentration risk. You know, if you find yourself in a situation where there's a, a control plane, you know, issue, like you, the, the, the blast radius becomes quite significant. Um, two is often organizations discover they just don't have the, the fundamental systems in place to do the update cycle and they get left behind. It's a very fast moving community. Um, and, you know, for most organizations, you know, we encourage organizations to have the ability to, to keep up with the community rather than get left behind, certainly to be able to, you know, stay current, stay secure, et cetera. Um, and, you know, just making sure you've made those investments. There's been a lot of good work done in the open source community around operationalization of Kubernetes. Um, you know, we've been huge sponsors of this effort called Cluster API, which is a way to actually use the Kubernetes control patterns to provision and manage Kubernetes. Um, it was really ideated around the idea of, of, of programmable infrastructure, meaning, you know, built for IIS destinations or virtualized destinations. But we're seeing tremendous amounts of engagement from the community that's actually figuring out how to make this work with bare metal um, nodes. So I think just getting that right out of the get go um, makes a ton of sense. Recognize that as individuals consumption of Kubernetes um, increases, the level of sophistication is going to increase as well. You know, we see organizations really embracing this custom resource definition model where it's not just about you know treating Kubernetes as a way to you know schedule a container. You can also start to encapsulate a lot of your application level logic or your workload logic in a in a custom resource definition. Um, but you often will find contention between you know these things that the control plane isn't effectively partitioned. So sometimes you actually want multiple clusters so that you don't uh, you know, don't inadvertently um, create contention at that level. So whether you like it or not, you're probably going to be in a multi cluster world. Um, you'll find yourself there sooner or later. Um, you'll find yourself wanting to run things that have privileged container access requirements, and you don't necessarily want to make those those um, capabilities available to everyone. So just set yourself up right from the get go with a, a scalable program. Sweat the details on the operational one on ones. Get your observability in place. Get your um, you know, get your security practices in place. And you know if if you if you roll it out at a measured pace, you will be able to keep up from an operations perspective. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely a, a key thing, you know, uh, when it comes to you know wanting to update your your Kubernetes control plane when you want to roll forward at a fast pace. If you don't have the automated CI and CD system set up to treat clusters as automatic and sort of disposable, you're going to end up with a lot more manual work than you need to. And there are tons of great projects out there, and products out there, to help you do that in a really easy way. One thing I've noticed in um, some of our customers' implementations is 
applying a sort of on-prem fixed data center mentality, but even to a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and so I've seen all sorts of uh, very <laughs> sort of inappropriate analogs to try to manage a particular node or a particular pod or deployment as a fixed resource and sort of this like uh, old mentality applied in a way that that uh, I think uh, is doesn't make a lot of sense, doesn't doesn't accord well with the underlying taste and spirit of how Kubernetes is uh, is designed. Um, I do I do. I do have some sympathy, perhaps, for some of these organizations that, um, Craig, you mentioned that a lot of Kubernetes was designed um, uh, to run in a VM, a in a cloud-native uh, way or cloud-native mentality. And uh, I've seen a lot of organizations sort of jump, uh, sort of skip that cloud-native step in the middle and then go all the way to Kubernetes. And because they haven't gone through that transition, they're still applying the like old-world mentality to this, this very, very new. A uh, new world. I'm curious if you guys have seen uh, uh, similar things, and maybe what you might recommend for for folks in that situation. All the time, every day, right? Like, um, you know, like I always joke, like, you know, the, the tech is easy. It's the people that are hard, right? Like, um, it's it's the organizational uh, inertia associated with this. It's the ITIL practices. It's the the way you reason about it, and um, certainly. You know, if you think about the sort of classic system administrator initiated world where you have individuals that are responsible for kind of what I think of as click ops practices where, you know, like I, I assign this, you know, and I make I file a ticket. The back end of that ticket is a work product, which is, you know, a, a provision machine that looks the right way. Um, and then you just, you know, try to layer in something like Kubernetes. It, it, you're missing a really important step, which is just investing in, you know, the you know, the automatable infrastructure. Like at the end of the day, um, we should be in a world where it's infrastructure is code. Um, if you think about the way that, you know, Kubernetes was optimized and built and, you know, what much of the community is really looking to support it, it, it does, in some ways, you sort of assume a, 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 a mature operating destination into which the, the, the technology can be deployed. And if you try to give that short shrift and you don't make the investments in, actually getting your automation in place, you know, being able to actually, you know, roll these updates and have an API surface area that, that, that Kubernetes can wire into to actually, you know, drive um, outcomes, you, you, you will find yourself in, in a, a bit of a pickle at some point. Um, and, you know, change is hard. Like, you know, I, I don't think folks, you know, fully internalize, it's not just about the infrastructure, it's also about the applications. You know, a lot of the patterns that this introduces creates far more ephemeral environments, you know, if your developers are used to SSHing into a machine to go and figure out what's happening to debug it, um, and now you're suddenly in this environment where it's a bunch of shared resources, you don't want to give developers direct access to the actual infrastructure. Um, if you haven't made the investments in your observability tools and the right levels of logging and tracing and, and other things, you, you're going to have a hard time from an operations perspective on the back end. And so it, it really is evolutionary. I, I think you know starting with a small group of individuals that you can you know, bring the right set of skills in to get them leveled up. You know, I'm not saying just go and hire a bunch of Kubernetes experts, but if you are at a position where you can, you know, find a team that's willing to learn, willing to change, willing to embrace a, a new way of operating, um, and then build some success around them, you know, advocate for the work that they've been doing, create learning opportunities where they can share that with some of the adjacent teams and, and work your way into it rather than trying to force a, a sort of structural change by fiat, you're going to be in much better shape. Definitely. And I, I think there's opportunities, too, for companies that are looking to invest in things like zero trust security initiatives, because naturally that come, what comes along with this operations focused way of deploying environments and much more ephemeral resources is much easier to tie credentials and secrets management to a least privilege model when you're fundamentally dealing with a lot of resources that are ephemeral. And so there's a lot of other benefits you can get out of making this change. But I agree with Craig, you know, starting with a core group that's looking holistically at all the different touch points on the systems in, 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 in the enterprise that need to adapt to this model and then growing it from that kernel out uh, is a really good way to do it. All of this advice seems totally fantastic. And uh, I, can, I can think of all the customers who, who would have benefited from this. Uh, and yet, I, I think a lot of what we've been talking about is sort of generic to, hey, if you need a Kubernetes, like here's like a bunch of tips and tricks. I'm curious, Chris, um, 
Is there anything particular to trying to enable ML ops or even just more basic data science training and machine learning workloads on Kubernetes for people who aren't just doing Kubernetes for sort of generic application infrastructure management reasons, but to actually facilitate um, these ML workloads? I'm uh, curious if you have any specific nuance around that. Well, I mean, today, by and large, if you're doing AI, if you're doing accelerated ML, that means that you're doing it on a GPU accelerated platform. And so that means that there are some additional considerations that you need to take into account. Uh, fortunately, as we were talking earlier, a lot of the complexities around uh, exposing GPUs in a way that you can take advantage of them with Kubernetes uh, have been solved today. You know, there's uh, everything from the, the NVIDIA packages that allow you to expose you know, uh, you know, GPUs to a container. So of course the applications can run on them. NVIDIA has a whole, you know, on the NGC catalog, a bunch of optimized validated containers that are ready to go that'll work in all these different infrastructures. But there's also, you know, operational support for, you know, uh, monitoring and visibility of GPUs that come along with something called the GPU operator using, you know, the operator framework that's been popularized in, in Kubernetes that takes care of setting up a lot of the infrastructure for you. Um, so I think, I think mostly it's just to, you know, plug into the, the ecosystem that exists there around enabling that specialized accelerated hardware platform. Um, and then the other aspect of it when it comes to the sort of the workflow of MLOps is, um, we see sort of, uh, a, a number of different ways that an organization may be targeting doing ML workloads. One of them is more towards, uh, an individual researcher wanting access to faster resources they can get on a lap than on a laptop or a workstation, maybe a closer locality for their processing to a data set that's in the data center. But they're really talking about using something like a, a notebook interface interactively to go and start doing some of their initial training runs or larger training runs or maybe data cleanup or things like that. And then there's a, there's a, a shift to a different style of operating, which is much more operational, much more continuous and, 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 and programmatic. And um, I think that the underlying, you know, operational architecture of Kubernetes and the the, the different abstractions and, and and things like Domino that have been built on top of Kubernetes can help make that transition happen. Um, and and that's one of those things that naturally comes about when you get from the early inception stage of a project and you're doing proof of concept. When you're starting to operationalize it, you want to you know validate the work that you're doing on a continual basis. You're starting to get into a, you know, a get driven or merge request driven model for how you're updating what you're doing, ultimately looking forward towards deployment. And, you know, deployment is a place where I think Kubernetes very uniquely shines too. So, uh, you know, I think, I think mostly to think about when you're thinking about, you know, MLOps beyond just Kubernetes, Kubernetes, I think is this engine that's going to enable you, but you have to think about where your projects are in that life cycle of development. And how are you going to plan out building the infrastructure that's appropriate for each stage? Absolutely. If I map on our Domino experience, I think, uh, and our sort of our product design philosophy that that really overlaps well, Chris. I think for us, there's there's a half of our product and what we try to uh, encode as a workflow in in the Kubernetes cluster we run on, which is that sort of development experience, whether that's a notebook or connecting to uh, you know, distributed compute to enable sort of training and scale. Um, and Kubernetes has been great at that in terms of both the open source community support uh, for, you know, different operators just for different distributed compute uh, types. Uh, but then also on the production side, you know, if you if you imagine uh, by analogy a, a running model as essentially a, a tiny, you know, highly specialized type of application, then all of the lessons around the scalability and the like operational ability uh, that little tiny application would happen, which happens to be a model. Uh, Kubernetes uh, takes care of all that. That's been uh, a tremendous boon for enabling our customers to 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 really go through those phases of the of the life cycle. And and Chris, obviously, uh, Nvidia and Domino have been have been working together on our support for NGC containers and the whole AI enterprise thing to help uh, make make that a much more seamless experience, so that customers don't have to try to figure out how to do ML ops on. Kubernetes about themselves. And I think one of the things that, you know, Craig said earlier about Kubernetes absolutely applies to this level of the solution as well, which is, and it's a people thing, not a technology thing, which is that 
if if you kind of haven't made that shift towards the operational stance of how you're going to approach solving this problem, you're going to give up on a lot of benefits that you can get out of not only Kubernetes, but the kind of MLOps solutions that are built on containers on top of Kubernetes. So if you're going out there and you're saying, I'm going to deploy, you know, I've done typing and I've deployed the Kubernetes cluster and now I'm operationalizing it by dividing it into namespaces. And you're hoping that then through development and deployment and operationalization of the full MLOps bike cycle, that underlying model and that mentality is going to continue. You're going to run into some real problems. Um, you really have to think about getting the automation and the tooling set up at each of those layers um, to, to let you scale. I'd love to spend a little bit of time um, chatting about a, a problem that I've seen um, working with our customers. Um, it's a big ecosystem and there are lots and lots of folks providing lots and lots of different uh, variants um, of Kubernetes, whether they're sort of enterprise grade products or uh, other, uh, other, other open source things uh, on top um, that are trying to build some traction. Lots of different flavors, Craig, lots of different versions, as you point out, particularly for an enterprise, it can be a little bit culturally challenging to, to move quickly, to want to move quickly, especially if you're coming from a more antiquated uh, mindset when it comes to, to managing these things. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious, how, how, how do you all or how have you seen your, your customers think about, um, you know, which flavor of, of Kubernetes to adopt and what some of those trade-offs are? I would say, um, you know, there's no, there's no one right answer. I think anyone who says there's one true thing is probably selling something. Um, so, and, you know, and to be clear, like most of my life, I do spend trying to sell something. Like that's, that's a big part of my job, right? But, um, you know, realistically, it, the, the question I'd ask is, you know, what does Kubernetes mean to you, right? Like, you know, there's Kubernetes as a way to design distributed systems. And there's Kubernetes as a way to, normalize a, a whole large tract of infrastructure. But there's also Kubernetes as a way to avoid concentration risk associated with a single cloud provider or uh, Kubernetes as a way to reason about new capabilities by you know, rolling out uh, high quality infrastructure into you know, widely distributed edge locations. So obviously it's gonna be a different answer depending on, on what the organization wants. Um, there's absolutely something to be said for an EKS, AKS, GKE, Go to the you know go to your favorite public cloud provider. You've already got a relationship with them. They're going to offer you up a, a Kubernetes um, offering, and that's a great way to just get going because you don't necessarily have to make all of these sort of systematic investments in you know figuring out your operational posture, your um, your, your your starting point there. But even with those types of offerings, at some point you are going to encounter some challenges. You know, I, I see a lot of organizations that have. Um, massive fragmentation of their Kubernetes fleet, even though they're only using managed cloud provider often, you know, versions of Kubernetes and they haven't necessarily made the investments in, in helping teams familiarize themselves with how to stay current, how to maintain, how to update. Um, they struggle with uh, the controls around uh, resource consumption and cost controls and all of those other pieces. So I think it's, 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 it's worth recognizing that, that that answer may change depending on where you are in your journey. Um, that answer will definitely change depending on you know where you're trying to deploy your um, your offering. Um, I always encourage folks to look at the person that they're going to work with, the, the provider as a partner in in their in their journey towards Kubernetes. Um, a big part of what I've done personally through my career is worked hard to establish myself as a partner. Um, that's not only representing you know the, the commercial interests of the company I'm working for, but also working to bridge into the open source ecosystem, working to make sure that that individual has someone that they can work with when they encounter those peculiar edge cases and, and need some changes made to the actual Kubernetes code base so that they can, you know, progress to to the next level. Um, so, you know, I think it's 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 always going to be situational. Um, I would suggest that if folks don't have a lot of expertise, you know, making some investments in just consuming a public cloud provider's service is, is a very good logical starting point. Um, but then, you know, ask, asking the hard question around. What can I get out of this? Do I want to be in a situation where I have procurement optionality? Do I want to be in a situation where I get economies of scope that complement the cloud provider's economies of scale? Meaning I'm going to make all my, met my widgets metrics. So I just buy metric drill bits and die sets and wrenches and everything else. And, and it, it reduces the cost of being able to deploy into a different environment. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a non-answer, I'm, I'm afraid, because um, it's, it's always going to be situational. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I definitely, you know, advocate for the sort of, you know, products that, that I'm building. You know, and, uh, it's a big part of the, the job and, and hopefully we'll be able to be a, a faithful steward to both the open source community that's just creating so much value and that enterprise customer that's looking to, to bring that technology into their, their environment. I really love the way you framed it, Craig. Um, Kubernetes is a tool, but to what end and to as an organization, uh, not get sucked into all the hype and energy, but to actually be thoughtful about, hey, are we really trying to create a vendor lock-in prevention strategy? Are we actually trying to enable DevOps or more rapid application development by like bringing, uh, uh, bringing a set of abstractions to a wider set of people? Or are we actually trying to drive usage of maybe GPUs um, through a more user-friendly uh, UX? These are all things that Kubernetes either directly or indirectly can enable, but if you're not clear about why you're doing this all, then uh, it makes all the sense in the world that you might trip yourself up uh, in the middle of that. And without a clear sense of requirements, it can be really impossible to make some of these more detailed decisions. I really like the second thing you said too, Chris, which is, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I, I, think, I think, you know, the idea of, of Kubernetes as this tool in this engine is right. It sets the tone for, a broad and diverse ecosystem of other offerings around it. And I, when I'm talking to folks, I'm generally talking to them from one of two dimensions through that, sort of projecting their solution either from the application side or from the operations side. And so, you know, one, from the operations perspective, everything we talked about, about, you know, treating clusters as cattle and observability and security and ephemeral resources and things like that. Um, that's really important. And, and the, the ecosystem there, I'd say, you know, look through the, like the cloud native ecosystem for what's going to be effective for you and your organization from an operations perspective to preserve and enable all of those aspects. If you want to, you know, automatically self serve, you know, clusters, if you want to integrate with your authentication, if, you know, all of those kind of things, your storage provider, right? Go and look through all of those options there to make sure that you can preserve the abstraction to the application side. Uh, uh, of all of the, the things that Kubernetes as an architecture provides. And then on the application side, you have a similar sort of thing where you say, I want to take advantage of either, you know, ease of use or scalability or the amount of diverse applications I can get onto this infrastructure. Look for those parts of the ecosystem that the application developers are going to want to take advantage of and just project through that ecosystem uh, onto Kubernetes to, to, to get the cap capabilities you need. Sorry, Chris, you were saying something. Point two. I was just bluffing. I just you know, sometimes you start with point one and see if you can make it up. No, I was just kidding. No, uh, no. The 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 second thing I did appreciate out of uh, Craig, uh, your, your advice was, um, you know, the public cloud providers really have made it easy to just click and experiment, and uh, the idea of just getting your hands dirty a little bit uh, seems like good advice for for a lot of organizations. Uh, I do see. I do talk to folks who. Uh, want to go zero to 100 uh, really, really fast. It's like, hey, we're all on-prem running Java directly on uh, bare metal hosts, and you know we're going to be fully containerized and Kubernetes native in, uh, in a couple of years. It's like, well, you know, there's probably a couple steps in between you should pass through uh, and learn as an organization where you're, where you're trying to take things. So, um, Well, um, thanks so much. Um, guys, for all of the great discussion and um, the uh, uh, the great tips and tricks, I'm sure our audience will will appreciate it. Craig, any any parting words uh, of advice or anything uh, you wanna you wanna plug before we go? Yeah, so uh, just very you know very quickly, um, Kubernetes is bringing a new set of capabilities that I don't think folks have fully got their head around. You see Kubernetes as a way to, you know, run Linux application containers. You see it as a way to unlock workloads. You see it as an infrastructure abstraction layer, like a logical infrastructure abstraction layer. There is another pattern that's emerging that I think is so powerful, which is it's also a way to get intent-driven IT into your environment. So looking and investing to get to the point where you can run applications in Kubernetes, but also looking at how you can use some of those patterns, um, the power of the Kubernetes API server, the power of the custom resource definition, a way to start introducing choreography instead of you know classic kind of workflow driven orchestration, 
Um, there's a lot more to the technology than just um, container scheduling. And so, you know, I definitely encourage folks to to just think about the utility of having intent-driven, declarative um, processes inside your organization. And that's that's something that I, I find fascinating and I'm personally kind of very invested in, in, in working towards. Craig, are, are there any books or blog posts or any material or talks you might direct uh, viewers to to... to to, to, to work through uh, and get smart about some of, some of the ideas you just mentioned? I think um, I'd have to kind of go and, and dig it up. My friend Joe's written a, a couple of um, papers on, if you, if you go and just look for, um, you know, Joe Beta and, you know, talking about um, choreography versus orchestration, that would be a good place to start getting, you know, some of the ideas uh, um, percolated. Um, I'd have to go and do a Google search for um, choreography and, and look at things like, um, level triggered systems if you're a, a deep engineer and, and you'll you'll learn a lot more. Uh, Chris, thank you for joining us as well. Any any parting thoughts? Yeah. So I mean I think, you know, as a starting point, you know, uh, as Craig said, tying it back, bring it back around to the very beginning, this all started with containers and containerized execution. And that's a really great place for somebody who's getting started, whether they're getting on started in the cloud or someplace else to get started. So the NGC containers ncc.nvidia.com for you know whatever an ML or AI you're thinking about doing from training all the way to deployment, uh, the AI enterprise uh, set of uh, suite from from NVIDIA that we work with you guys on, the Triton inference server, um, which is this optimized inference server across CPU and GPU. It's basically the, the most powerful inference server across any infrastructure type. Getting an example workflow just you know sketched up with containers that ties these things together projecting the way that you expect it to ultimately work for your deployment and then uh, evolving from there is a really great way to start. Fantastic. Uh, well, I certainly learned uh, a lot. Um, it's fantastic to hear uh, maybe some of the, the early stories. And I, I really appreciate it, uh, uh, particularly, Chris, how, how uh, you all have had to do a little bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat to, uh, to, to shift a sort of HPC mentality uh, over into a Kubernetes native uh, uh, mentality, and I, I do hope our uh, our, our uh, listeners here uh, picked up at least a couple tips and tricks. I think uh, if I could leave folks with uh, with a thought, um, obviously uh, Domino is a is a software platform. Uh, Craig, uh, we're all I suppose trying to sell something in our own ways, but um, certainly what we've figured out over the years, um, both on our own and working in close contact with our customers, is you know, what it really takes to uh, bring ML ops uh, into the enterprise. Uh, part of that is really relying on Kubernetes and its abstractions and, and the community, but uh, a whole lot of our, our partners as well, Chris, uh, you mentioned NGC and the NVIDIA AI enterprises are, those are areas where we are actively collaborating to, uh, uh, to bring some of that ML ops love to our, to our shared customers. So uh, definitely uh, looking forward to, uh, engaging with the broader community to see if there are more MLOps best practices we can uh, further on Kubernetes together. Awesome. Thank you for uh, having me. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.